and welcome to the research podcast from Georgia State University, available wherever podcasts are found. In each episode, we highlight interesting and innovative research happening at Georgia State, and we feature a different faculty member and a different topic each month, so you can learn more about research taking place across the university. I'm Jennifer Rainey Marquez, your host and Associate Director of Research Communications at Georgia State. My guest in this episode is Brian Bride, Director of the University's School of Social Work. Today, we're chatting with Dr. Bride about his research on secondary traumatic stress and how it impacts social workers, medical workers, EMTs, and those in other caring professions. Thank you so much for joining us today, Dr. Bride. Thank you, Jennifer, for having me. Let's start by uh, explaining to our listeners exactly what you mean by secondary traumatic stress. What is this exactly? So secondary traumatic stress is a phenomenon that's experienced by all sorts of types of caregivers, social workers, medical caregivers, as well as even friends and family members of people who've been traumatized. And what it refers to is the process of being psychologically traumatized by their work when their work is with those who've been directly traumatized. So secondary trauma is essentially the same as post-traumatic stress. The difference is that rather than being directly traumatized by something occurring, the trauma is hearing about it or learning about it from someone else. Hmm. And um, what are some of the symptoms that people might experience? Just like post-traumatic stress, things like um, intrusion or re-experiencing symptoms, those are things like having distressing dreams or nightmares about the trauma or their experiences at work, Um, feeling like something bad might happen, having avoidance symptoms or hyperarousal symptoms. Hyperarousal symptoms tend to be those uh, like physiological anxiety, heart heart beating, sweating, being jumpy. Um, and those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. All the things that PTSD is really known for itself. Um, And are there certain common triggers for secondary traumatic stress? Um, I'm thinking of people, you know, can you do this work for years and be fine and then suddenly this becomes an issue? Well, there's no um, one way that it occurs, but certainly one of the biggest risk factors is being newer to the field or the profession that one's engaging in. So we see in the first two years of someone's professional career that there's a a much higher risk for experiencing secondary traumatic stress or put differently, they may experience worse symptoms of secondary traumatic stress. Um, So part of that we think is that over the course of time, Um, individuals develop coping skills within their profession and how to begin to handle these sorts of things. Um, Is there sometimes, um, you know, something to be said for the fact that we're in the middle of, you know, obviously a a pandemic, Um, we're dealing with the coronavirus and caregivers are dealing with not only the normal stress of taking care of patients, they're also dealing with the stress of worrying about their own well-being, um, you know, the, the, the issues that are being faced by their patients might hit close to home. Does this raise their risk of developing secondary traumatic stress? Yes, it definitely can. Um, you know, keep in mind that uh, the situation we're in is stressful, as you mentioned, but um, it, really, it really can be traumatic as well. Beyond that, it involves the potential death and actual death of family, loved ones, of patients, of of uh, clients that we're working with. So it's it, it adds on another layer of potential trauma onto the tra- the potential secondary trauma that already exists in the workplace. Mm-hmm. Um, do you? This is you know potentially um, a guess on your part, but do you think that, or do you expect that we'll see more secondary traumatic stress as a result of the pandemic? I definitely think that the pandemic uh, is likely to increase secondary traumatic stress symptoms and the the incidence of it. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. 
You also mentioned another issue, which I thought um, was an interesting additional facet to this, which is this moral um, stress or distress that a lot of caregivers might be facing during the pandemic. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Well, moral distress uh, comes about really when one has to make, as a professional, make a decision often concerning a patient or a client that is not necessarily the, the what they feel is the moral or ethical decision to make, but there are other constraints that prevent them from making the correct decision or, the, or what they feel is the right decision. A, a example would be the potential of for instance, rationing care during this pandemic, where in normal circumstances that wouldn't be an issue. Um, but we've seen a lot in the news about the possibility of, of ERs and ICUs being overwhelmed and how do we begin to choose who gets what treatment and when. Um, so so there's the that, that would be a real example of someone having to make decisions that impacts the life of someone else, even though uh, they, they may not believe that that's the correct decision. Right. And these people, you know, people that go into these professions are often doing it because they want to help other people. And I can see how facing those kinds of decisions would be um, morally challenging. So, exactly. They're, they're driven by the notion that they're, they're there to help, whether they're in the healthcare field or the social service field. Um, but situations have changed and now there becomes a process of having limited resources and um, that their decisions or sometimes indecisions might have an impact that's much greater on, on other people than they, than they originally would have. I'm also wondering, um, sort of coming out of this idea that you might be second guessing yourself, um, you know, in, in the moment as you're treating patients. But I also wonder if people um, who are just entering their careers in these fields during the pandemic might be second guessing their decision to do this kind of work in the first place. I mean, you mentioned that this type of trauma often impacts young people. What are we going to see among, you know, new caregivers right now? Well, I think there's a, a couple of things that, that may occur. Certainly, there's I think there's going to be a group of professionals entering the field who um, are thinking that this is not what I signed up for, right? Mm -hmm. I, that things are much at a much greater severity, um, things are in crisis, um, and they just wanted to help in whatever their profession was, um, but weren't really comfortable with being in a crisis situation. Uh, and so that adds just another layer, another stressor, another layer of stress on them. Um, some people may, may just decide to not pursue that field of, of uh, work. But uh, on the other hand, I would say, I think there's also others in the medical and social service fields who are um, feeling like they will, they're really doing what they went, to, went into their profession to do, and they're getting to do it right away. Um, and I think the other layer of that then becomes that it's possible that um, being in this situation may inspire more people to go into the medical and social service fields. For those people that find themselves in the middle of this who are um, either new to this work or not, are there coping mechanisms that are effective at guarding against this type of secondary trauma? Yeah, and it, there are, are some things that can be done. Individual professionals particularly need to be first aware that secondary trauma is something that they may be facing in the work that they do. Um, they need to be aware of what the symptoms are and be able to constantly or continually monitor whether they're experiencing those symptoms or the negative effects of, of their work. Um, but perf what they can do to help prevent or deal with it if they do recognize they're having those symptoms is uh, personal and professional self-care. So doing things in their, in their own lives and in their professional lives that will allow them to de-stress and take a break and um, look at what's occurring with uh, 
a particular lens that's positive for instance, remembering that they're helping people, um, that they're improving individuals' lives, that they're saving lives. Um, those, so having an appreciation for the work they do and really reminding themselves that it's, it's for, for a positive effect can be, can be very helpful. The other piece of self-care is, is uh, to really make sure that they take time to leave work at work, get away from the work some, spend time with their social support network, whether that be family or friends, exercise, eat healthily, get enough sleep, um, those sorts of things. I'm also curious, you talked about things that an individual can do um, to help protect themselves, but how do um, organizations or just, uh, you know, society, how do we start to address this impact that could be so large in the wake of um, the pandemic in particular and help protect providers so that they do stay in the field and that we don't find ourselves, like you said, with people um, who are too overwhelmed and get burned out as a result of this? I think it's particularly important for organizations and systems that employ these professions recognize and um, value secondary traumatic stress as a potential occupational hazard. That meaning that it's they recognize that this is a very real phenomenon that it can impact negatively their um, their employees, their professionals, which therefore might also impact the quality of care that's given to patients and clients. Um, so there was a time in, in many areas where there would be an attitude that individuals who were experiencing or presenting with secondary traumatic stress symptoms were simply not cut out for the job. What our research, part of what our research shows is it's fairly normal for people to have some symptoms um, and over the course of a career, many people will experience a number of those symptoms. That doesn't mean that they can't recover from those. So rather than uh, organizations looking negatively upon it, it's important for organizations to recognize that secondary traumatic stress is part of what their professionals are going to experience and therefore have a organizational culture that is accepting of that, not just accepting of that, but also puts in place mechanisms through policies and procedures that help protect them from the most negative impacts. Things like having um, good health and behavioral health care uh, insurance, having adequate time off, uh, being really open to hearing that someone needs to take some time off from work due to uh, mental health issues, um, those sorts of things. Mm -hmm. And, and I keep and, uh, these sorts of things. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, this has been really fascinating. And clearly, I think an issue that's going to need a lot of attention, um, you know, in the in the coming months and probably even years. So I just want to thank you so much for joining us um, to talk about your work, Dr. Bride. Thank you. This has been an episode of the research podcast from Georgia State University featuring Brian Bride, director of the university's School of Social Work and an expert in post-secondary traumatic stress. For more conversations about research taking place across Georgia State, look for the research podcast wherever podcasts are found. Thanks for listening and be sure to subscribe so you don't miss future episodes.